Oski Banzer. Along here is Michael Caro, and I just want to say thank you for being a guest on my talk show. Cute. Thanks for having me, man. I really appreciate it. No, the honor is all mine. And now, the, for the whole point of Uncensored, is to show people that even with a learning disability, I can still overcome controversy, reach my goals in life, at the same time turning myself into a perfect example for people out there deaf, blind, or in a wheelchair. But you should never label yourself or have people label you. And you should prove to them you can still mount to something. And that's the whole statement I'm making. And like I said, it's a half hour, 45 minute conversation. You can ask me anything. You can curse if you want to. You can talk about anything you want to. So starting off, what can you tell me about yourself? Yeah, sure. Um, uh, pretty much to start, I'll kind of like transitioning to kind of a little bit of your story too is... Um, Again, my name is Mike. I, I really started in sports my whole life, and um, I, I'm very fortunate that I've grown up with um, a very strong influence of entrepreneurs and business owners and, you know, just really um, people that just give positive reinforcement to anything that I want to do. It always made me think, like, why more people don't either pursue goals or dreams or, you know, even go into business for themselves. And then I realized that there's a lot of people out there that either live in a negative environment or they just don't have the influence or the same role models that I've been fortunate enough to grow up with. So, you know, my whole life I've, you know, tried to be a business owner and, you know, I started my own business, The Life of a Fighter. And what we do is our goal, one of the biggest goals is to inspire other people, kind of like a great story with what you're sharing is, um, you know, that just because you have some form of a disability or something that happened to you doesn't mean it can hold you back and you shouldn't try to attain certain goals because we're all meant to, you know, shine and achieve things. It's just a matter of are you going to be able to pursue it and do it and what kind of environment are you in? So what I did was um, I'm very, again, fortunate for my athletic background. I found mixed martial arts, Brazilian jiu-jitsu, and kickboxing. I moved out to Las Vegas. I dropped everything. Um, I, I wanted to be a pro fighter. So, you know, I was very lucky that I got taken in by the Extreme Couture Camp and Robert Drysdale and the Couture team and all the amateur and professional fighters. Um, I saw what it was like to live as a fighter and a lot of sacrifices you have to make. And a lot of them are homeless or living at the gym or, you know, they were like all living together in a house, like 10 people meant for three. And these struggles, again, motivated me to create this company, The Life of a Fighter, and show people that originally that it's, you know, not as easy as it seems. And just because you're a professional fighter, you don't have a huge paycheck necessarily and that you need to kind of pursue it and sacrifice a lot. And originally, I just wanted to share that. And we've grown over the last three years as a company to where we want to share that perspective of like your fight, like perfect example of what's your fight is one of our marketing campaigns. And we want to hear from people that what are you fighting for? Like you may be fighting to have a successful talk show and you might be fighting to have a successful business or anything that's kind of coming along with that. Or you might be fighting just stereotypes from a disability perspective. And all those things are what we want to hear from people and share with our website at lifeofafighter.com and kind of go into from there. All right. Well, I do have an idea for you. I just want to talk to you after the show about it. I love it. Now, I saw um, you also were a editor at the MMA. Is that true? Yes. I'm a MMA editor for Men's Edition Magazine. Um, Life of a Fighter, we, we signed a, a deal with them where we're doing all the editing for their MMA section. And um, they're specifically a, a men's-themed lifestyle magazine ex exclusively here on Long Island in New York. And it's really our first venture into the print magazine world and that kind of stuff because we have online media and our online content and all that base. But now we want to go to more of a physical presence, whether it be in magazines, brick and mortars. And, um, you know, we're working with the UFC gym here in Huntington Station. And we want to kind of just continuously evolve and go from there. All right, you know, I usually, I usually talk, <laughs> I usually joke around about the MMA. I'm not really a big fan, but I, just as one guy, I don't know if you got a chance to work with him. It's uh, Jason David Frank. What's his name? He, he was Jason David Frank, you need Mighty Mark from Power Ranger guy. Oh, okay. Uh, no. Never worked with him, but I know who you're talking about. <laughs> you know, I usually said, uh, I said something to him. I said, when are you going to give up the human cockfighting and it go into acting? <laughs> and that's, honestly, that's a really good point, what you bring up, is that, especially because I'm from New York, I live in New York, um, we don't have MMA legal here. 
but yet we have such history with Madison Square Garden and all the big fights that have fought here. Like we had all those big things. Even you know Jersey is legal to fight, so you have Atlantic City right there. But it's a shame it's not here. And that's the perspective a lot of people have that it's pretty much just human cockfighting. But if you really look at it from another perspective as opposed to where you just see the blood and all that stuff but that's another thing we wanted to shed light onto is my company is if you go to our website you'll see interviews and you'll see training videos and you'll see that they have families and that they have a certain lifestyle that you wouldn't expect a fighter to have that they're raising a little daughter that's two years old and they're not you know cursing or meatheads and that we're intelligent 70 percent of ufc fighters went to college and that's a big statistic that a lot of people don't know well i do have a great idea if you want to to partner up or support it. Drop it on. I love ideas. I'm always about it. <laughs> are, you, are you a fan of Dragon Ball Z? Of course. <laughs> Who isn't? Best animation cartoon out there. I'm 100% with you on that. <laughs> and they're, they have something called a World Martial Arts Competition. Okay. And I was like, oh, maybe we can work something out. You, you work with a lot of fighters. Maybe we can rent a gym and start out small and see if everyone um, picks up on it. Basically, for people out there who don't know what the old martial arts competition is, basically fighters from the United States to Canada to Japan, all over the world, come and they compete in the best 16 entering the tournament. And at the end, that champion will be known as the world's strongest fighter. Now, if UFC did that, okay, I can get behind that because there's a point behind it, not two, two dudes grappling each other on the floor and whatever. <laughs> but if you did, there was a whole point It's saying, I'm the champion, I'm the strongest guy. For example, um, Brock Lesnar, WWE champion, he's the strongest guy for them. And now if you have a guy who's a champion for your company, you think you can say, I'm the strongest guy, and you know the chemistry would be, who's the strongest, your guy or his guy? Exactly. And that's, I mean, that's a pretty good point. And that's kind of like what the basis of the UFC was built on when, when um, the Gracie family kind of started it. They had the idea of, like, our style is the best. Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu is, you know, the most effective self-defense style, the most effective combat style, and they challenged, literally, they would challenge everyone in the world. They would put up newspaper articles and invite people and go to other gyms and challenge them. And that was the original game plan, was to say, listen, all the guys around the world, who thinks they're better than us, come down, here's a belt, here's some money on the line, see if you can beat me. And that's what started the whole thing, and that's what made it so attractive and popular. Now, of course, it's grown and it's a little bit more well-known, but there's still that concept there, but it's now weight classes. So, would you say, like, no weight classes now and it's just you versus them and then if you win you move on to the next round or is it still broken down weight classes and whatnot that's a good question um i would just say try a little bit of both and see what happens okay i mean if if you're looking at the weight class thing then realistically any fight promotion i spent like bellator and ufc they kind of they pretty much do that they they have you know, where they'll have their top-ranked guys and they'll do it, but unless you're UFC caliber, like, not anyone can enter, just like in the, the Martin, the World Martial Arts Tournament, anyone could enter. Anyone could go into the division. There's no um, necessarily qualifications. In the UFC, they have to select you. So it could, I guess it could be a little biased. So maybe what they could do is do an open tournament, like what Bellator does. They have a tournament. They have, you know, eight guys in a division or, or 16 guys, and they each fight each other, and the, the top guy... He moves up, fights the champion, gets a big bonus. Maybe what they should do is an absolute open promotion version of it where it's UFC, Bellator, every fight promotion, everyone in the world. Don't even worry about if you're part of the UFC or not. They go fight at this huge tournament, and there's a lot of money to be made, and there's also a lot of honor to be had from it. I think that, that could be something that works, but realistically, the business people in it, I don't see them letting their fighters go fight in another promotion for someone else to make money unless they got a big, big payday from it. And that's usually on full... Yeah, I'm here. So sorry about that. I don't know. It just walked up for some reason. But what were you saying? No, I was just pretty much saying that I think that any fight promotion or any promoter that if they would even allow their fighters to go and go into this world tournament or even if they would host it. Let's say the UFC hosts this world tournament, which I think would be a good marketing strategy. But they would have to allow other fighters from other promotions come in 
to fight, and then there would have to be a big payout. Otherwise, other fighters from other promotions, their promoters probably wouldn't let them break contract to go fight for them because of the potential risk of injury, they're not making money, and they lose their biggest star power or, or whatever have you. So there, there would probably have to be a couple little loopholes or like you know obstacles to overcome. But, I mean, it's, it's definitely something I think that would be pretty awesome to see. But realistically... It's, it's really up to the UFC. If they're willing to do that, they have some of the best fighters in the world. So they would have to be on board, otherwise it wouldn't work. All right. Well, were you also a... Um, I saw, I'm looking at your LinkedIn, just so I'm maxing up your questions. So I yeah. saw you're also a wrestler. Do you still perform wrestling moves, or do you miss it, or is it just in the past? Yeah, that's a good question. I actually, um, believe it or not, I have a stronger background in Taekwondo and kickboxing. I did that since I was about like 10 years old. And when I um, graduated high school and I went to college, I, I started at Stony Brook um, when I was 18, 2005. I'm 27 now. And the first year, like, I, I just missed baseball. I didn't compete because I, I wasn't really going to be competitive on a college level. Um, and I knew that. But I, I just missed sports. So what I did was I was lucky that they had a Brazilian jiu-jitsu club off campus. So I joined it, and I loved the grappling aspect because it was something new to me. I never did. Um, it's always awkward at first in the beginning sometimes when you're just like rolling around with another dude <laughs> once you understand that there's a little bit more to it than that and it's an actual art form and it's martial arts and it's, there's a lot of things that you can do with it I then um, you know got more involved and I really only started wrestling last year because I left college for four years from 20 uh, 21 like my junior year I moved out to Vegas I left for a couple years I came back and I stayed out of school for a little because you know, I was still c competitively fighting as an amateur, trying to transition to pro. And right before, the year before, my um, I wanted to go pro and make my transition when I had about, you know, four MMA fights. And I wanted to get about another five or six in. I got injured. I, I have a bunch of back issues I'm still dealing with two years later. And I wrestled last year to see how my body felt. So I've only really wrestled one competitive year in college. And um, it's definitely a big difference. I wish I would have wrestled in high school when I was younger. And, um, you know, I'm really fortunate that the team over there and Coach, uh, Coach Sean Lally, he's a great dude, really, really good background, and they're really building a strong program over there that I, I'm fortunate enough to have been a part of. And that this year I'm, you know, looking to start in January. You know, everyone knows wrestling season starting now. Um, just because of my injuries, I'm missing out on a couple of months. I'm slowly transitioning back, and I've been on that recovery process, but hopefully I'll be able to wrestle again this year because this is going to be my last year. I'm finally back to school and graduating. Um, so, I mean, I miss it in the sense of because I'm injured right now, but I'm still so competitively in it and around it that it's, it's something I do every day. And even when I'm done, regardless of going pro and how long that takes me or wherever I am or how far it takes me, I'm always going to stay in the sport as a coach, no matter what happens with my company. Um, no matter what I do, I'm always going to train and I'm always going to be a part of it because it's something that's changed my life. All right. Now, what's the difference between UFC and MMA? That is a great question. Like, that is like probably the most important question in the world that revolves around martial arts in general. So mixed martial arts is the sport, just like baseball would be the sport or football or soccer. Now, the UFC stands for Ultimate Fighting Championship. And what that is, is a promotion that represents fighters or collects fighters to put on a show. Just like the Major League Baseball um, is the premier promotion, UFC is just the promotion or the league for fighters to compete in. Because there's other ones out there like Bellator or World Series of Fighting, all these others. And they're all MMA, but UFC is just its own fight promotion. So you can fight MMA, but no one fights UFC. That's a big misconception in the way they use the wording and the vocabulary is the UFC is a fight promotion. MMA is the sport in and of itself. All right. Well, do you think MMA and UFC are um, on the same page, or do you think you're competition? Yeah, that, uh, that's a good question. Like, so, I, I really... The UFC just makes MMA as a sport better because they're bringing more awareness, notoriety, and just, you know, attention to it. Because without the UFC, really, there would be no MMA, you know. There is always a concept of mixing martial arts, and that's where MMA comes from, mixed martial arts. You're taking two different martial arts forms, putting them together, and seeing what happens. Like, you take boxing and wrestling, now you're a mixed martial artist because 
you can do the striking, and you can grapple. If you can't do both, it's really not mixed martial arts. Or if you don't have two different strikings, you need to have two different styles that you're mixing together for it to be MMA. But anyways, kind of, that kind of got a little off topic. The UFC just really kind of helps MMA. MMA really is just not really doing too much for UFC in the sense of it's just what they do. It's the, it's the sport that they promote. But MMA is not really negatively impacted by the UFC. If anything, it can only benefit. But MMA really is just the umbrella that everything else falls underneath. So it doesn't have necessarily as much of the influence as all these promotions has on MMA. All right. Now, for example, if you saw something on UFC that you really like, like a good fight, would you copy it on uh, MMA or would you try to always be different? Now, I, like... Um, Trying to understand exactly or explain it in the right way. Uh, so anything that you would see in the UFC, it depends on how you'd want to apply it. Because again, it's just the fight promotion in and of itself. It's not MMA is not a separate promotion. So anything you can do in the UFC wouldn't be a bad idea to replicate in another MMA fight promotion. But it always depends. Like obviously, the UFC is the leading company that makes the most money in this industry. Um, but sometimes, you know, certain fighters may just want to wrestle, take you down, and, and score points, and that may not be the best thing to learn from that particular fighter organization and take to another MMA promotion. Um, but realistically, if they're doing it in the UFC and it's working, you're probably going to want to do it and copy it because it's an effective technique or tactic or w whatever it is that they're using. It's probably going to work for any other fight promotion or really any other fighter because, again, the UFC is that top echelon, top tier of the fighters and the promotion. All right, well, for a perfect example, WWE copying TNA or TNA copying WWE, do you think they're just lazy and they can't come up with their own shit? Or do you think it's, they come up with a good idea if they want to do it too? For the WWE and TNA or just like MMA and you got like all that stuff? Well, for an example, WWE copies M. Uh, TNA and TNA copies WWE. Do you think that's good for business, or do you think that's just a lack of creativity? That's a good question. I, I really think that's um, that goes down to the business aspect of it. And to me, really, the most sincere form of flattery is replication or copying something. So if someone copies something from you, it's more than likely because they either want what you have, get the results that you got, or... Maybe they're lazy, but nine times out of ten, especially when it's a business that successful, they're doing it because it either works or they think it'll work, not because they're necessarily lazy. It could be maybe they don't have ideas, and that can have a part of it, but why not use something that you know works, but put your own little spin on it. For example, like, you know, Life of a Fighter, where a health and fitness media and, you know, MMA company. But there's other companies out there that do health and fitness, and there's other companies that do MMA, but we put our own spin on it where we're doing something I really don't think any other company's doing in general in the world right now. So I think it's taking a good idea that you know works and putting your own spin on it that makes it the most effective thing possible. So is it lazy? Eh, I don't know. Is it smart business? Possibly. If it makes you money, then yeah, it is. So I don't really see anything wrong with it if you do it the right way. All right. Now, how did you create your own company? What was your motivation behind it? That's uh, that's a good question too. Like I mentioned a little bit before, with the, you know, I was living in Vegas, and um, you know, I saw a lifestyle that fighters had to live and a sacrifice they had to make, and what I was even sacrificing, and just pretty much working and training, not doing anything else, not having a lot of money, um, and just loving life. Any regardless, like I love it. Uh, Ever since I got into MMA, I've been super just excited and happy about life for the most part. There's really very little things to be that you can complain about. Um, and again, my goal was I wanted to just share my perspective as a fighter in the beginning. And I just wanted to get some sponsors and make some money and, and pursue my fight career. But as it grew, we were very lucky that we got Prilosec OTC on board and we were the first ever uh, MMA. I was the first ever MMA fighter they sponsored. We were the first MMA company they worked with. So from there, it built to, you know, let's share our vision, not just from my own perspective, but other fighters, and let's help fighters out. Now it's to the point where, realistically, we really want to live to the original goal of sharing that lifestyle, but really we want to improve people's lives. So we want to educate people with our content, and, you know, we have services and products, and we have free content we have on our website with 
all the different things that we do in videos. We want to inspire people with stories, like sharing even your story, Keith. It's an amazing story that, you know, this is what you want to do and that you're going after it no matter what, you know, obstacles could be in your way. And we want to inspire, again, inspire people with that. And then ultimately, if we're not improving people's lives, that's the third part. We're not really making any use of the first parts. So I was motivated because I wanted to educate people, inspire them, and improve their lives at the end of the day and really just kind of change the world as classy or as cliche and corny as that sounds. That's ultimately what I, I want to do with this company. All right. Now, is it just MMA just for guys or is it also for women too? That's a good question too. So um, it's for everybody, for kids, guys, girls, grandmas, grandpa, like. I have clients as young as six years old, and I have clients as old as 60 years old. So I, there's a very, very wide spectrum of people that I personally work with and I know other coaches work with. Um, but the really you know, cool thing I think about it is that now the UFC and other fight promotions not only have the men fighting, but they have women fighting as well. And a lot of times... You'll watch a woman's fight and be like, damn, that was the best fight of the card. That was the best fight that we saw all night long because they are willing to put it on the line. And I'm telling you, they're not scared to hit, not scared to get hit. They put it out there sometimes more than us guys do. So um, it's definitely for both men and women. i give you a perfect example. You know, there's two women that stand out in my mind. Um, Trish Stratus okay. and Gail Kim. And the reason I bring them up is that they're both beautiful, number one. And, you know, true stress, you know, when she started with a blonde, you know, she was busty, and she was gorgeous, and she, she had the looks. But as far as a wrestling, she wasn't really good in it. Yeah. But, uh, you know, she, I guess, she, she was good at eye candy, and she raked in the money, and they sort of threw a belt on her. You know, Gail Kim, she's now at her... <laughs> Let uh, me rephrase that. She's attractive, but she knows how to kick ass and really know how, you know, to throw it down. Now, what I'm trying to say is, is it more about having eye candy, or is it actually have putting on a good show and having someone who knows what they're doing kick someone else's ass? That's, I mean, that's a great question, too. Uh, from my perspective, especially in the MMA world, it's ideally about both, meaning that you would, for a promoter's perspective, if you can have someone that's very attractive and that's willing to fight and be an entertainer, that's the ultimate package. But more in MMA than you'll see in wrestling is that you can have someone that's maybe less physically attractive, and that's always subjective, you know, depending on who's looking at it and whatnot. But, you know, um, they have the current, you know, um, bantamweight champ, uh, I'm sorry, 135-pound champ, Ronda Rousey, She's, you know, a kick-ass fighter, and she's also very beautiful. She does tons of magazine covers. Um, you know, she does very provocative modeling, and she's a beautiful person and a beautiful woman. So, you know, that's their ideal, and that's their poster child. But they also have other fighters that, you know, maybe not necessarily be the most attractive, but they fight, and they pay them, and they book them to fight. And I think that's more important to the fans is who's willing to be an entertaining fighter and just come in there and put it on the line. And that's what they want to see. No, I agree with you, but do you think for a business standpoint, well, I mean, okay, so it's more like a guy question. If yeah. you had, <laughs> I know a lot of people are going to make fun of me for this, but if you yeah. had an attractive blonde and then you had an Asian girl who knows how to kick someone's ass, what would you personally, what would you use for a hood ornament or poster child? for your company? Would you use like a fitness model or would you use a um, an athlete who knows how to kick ass? What do you think would get over more? Personally, I would, for a long-term investment and a long-term return, I'll take the fighter 10 out of 10 times only because the model is going to be great for marketing the first fight. It's going to be great for the initial marketing. But once she gets in the cage and she gets her ass kicked, nobody is really going to come back for a second or a third or a fourth fight. And that's what fight promoters want to do. They want to be able to create a name and be known for putting on entertaining fights. Like, hey, not for, okay, I produced 100 champions or X, Y, and Z, but no, I put on entertaining fights. The crowd's going to come back, and they enjoyed what they watched. And that's where, in this particular example, the kick-ass fighter will be able to deliver more, and then that's where the long-term, the benefit comes in to get more money out of it. All right, and now that's a question on the subject. 
is do you think women deserve to be in the main event? i give you a perfect example. WWE did it only once or maybe twice. They had their um, WWE Diva Legends do like the main event of 2004 and maybe like 2010. And yesterday I saw on TNA they had a knockout match so it's the main event. Do you think you shouldn't look at it as being sexist. Do you think women deserve as much ring time or air time as the guys? Or Yeah, I think that's a great question. And I, I really do think that, like UFC, again, going back to them, for example, Ronda Rousey was the main event on, I think it was two of their fight cards. And they did some great numbers with those fight cards. Um, I know it wasn't record breakers, but they had great fight cards. They also had other... Um, for one of them, they had another title fight, uh, but they're still going to be able to pull a strong audience and be entertaining at the same time. Again, going back to as long as they're talented fighters, I have no problem with um, you know a female being a main event. What I think is a bigger issue is not even the females, but the lighter weights, like the flyweights, the one thirty five or the one twenty five pound fighters, one thirty five pound fighters. They need to have less pull sometimes than the women, even because they're smaller scaled, and even though they're men. And they, they'll be made of it. They're not as entertaining sometimes to, to the general audience. So I think that, you know, just because you're a, a woman or just because whatever your weight is, or it doesn't necessarily dictate if you should be a main eventer or not. Again, at the end of the day, it's an entertainment business, even though it's sports. As long as you're entertaining, you're making money, and I think that's what it should be about. Now, you bring up a good thing about talking about the weight. And now, moving on to the other subject, the, uh, like we were talking about wrestling. During the 90s, it was this big thing it was wrong. WWF versus WCW. And now, WWE is three hours on every Monday. Don't ask me why. It's a stupid idea. But, uh, again, i tell you why it's a stupid idea. Because they have the same people for three hours. You have Triple H. You have John Cena, Randy Orton. And they, it's like it's the same segment for three hours. Like, come on. Well, where's everyone else? Now, if you look at it, WCW used to be three hours. And then and they were great because they had the first hour, the Cruiserweights, you know, Rey Mysterio, Psychosis, Hubitu, Eddie Guerrero, um, Chavo. He had these people flying over the place. And it was entertaining. It was a real, I, I missed the Cruiserweights. Second hour, he had the mid carters And then in the last hour, he had the main eventers. If you do that... You're going to get people interested because it's not the same old shitty thing over and over. It's for, they call it whatever they used to call it. The Triple H show or the John Cena show because it's three hours of them. And no wonder the numbers are going down. It's like just have some freaking variety, variety in there. You know, they do have the women out, but they're out for five minutes or they have a fast match. And so what the hell is this? Yeah, and that's, I mean, I really don't know enough about, you know, wrestling to really comment on why they've done it, but I used to be a huge wrestling fan when I was younger, and that's what I loved. I loved the main events, and you love seeing a different variety of wrestlers, because you can only see the same match so many times before, again, it's not entertaining, and that's what they're here to do. They're the entertainment business, and um, it's, it's, it's unfortunate, but I mean, at the end of the day, listen, obviously... They know what they're doing to an extent because they've built this empire, so I'm sure that they'll come up with, like, what, aren't they doing a new league in, in Florida, the, um, uh, it's the next generation? Uh, next gen NXT. Yeah, NXT. Aren't they supposed to be more exciting than the uh, WWE itself? Like, that's, a buddy of mine's really into wrestling, and he talks about this all the time, and um, I think that's, again, you always have to make sure you have the proper prospects coming up, otherwise, what are you doing? That's true, and, and there's a lot of people that are, that I would agree with you, NXT is more exciting when watching Raw or SmackDown because it's the same old bullshit. Now you have young people, and you're being creative, creating new stories and new characters and then moves, and that's why it's so fluent than if you look at it at something that's, I don't know, you know and how... Two questions. First one is, if WWE did brought back the Cruiserweights and they catered more to the women for the like this first hour Cruiserweights, second hour would be about the Divas, 
the third hour about the main eventers, you know, then it would be good. Now, how that question is directed at you in MMA is do you think you guys would ever go three hours? And do you also think you would also, I know there's something called the weight class, like we were discussing, but do you think it would be just, I don't know if there's actually titles for the way, different weight classes, but do you think it would benefit you guys more and also get a TV deal because you're having more different variety on your show? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. I, we do currently, with the way they have weight classes set up, each promotion and each fighter will have a weight class, and you also have a title for that particular weight class. So, for example, I fight the 170-pound to 185-pound weight class, depending on the, whoever my opponent is, weight cutting, etc. So there's titles you can win for each class. And um, as far as TV deals go, I mean, each different fight promotion already has either a fight deal in place or the bigger ones do where they're working on them and they're coming up with ways to stream it so that they can get out to more people, not just pay-per-views, because on Spike TV for a while, the UFC was partnered with them. Now it's Bellator with Spike TV. Um, the UFC has like a big deal now with Fox and Fox Sports 1 and all their, their other affiliate channels. So now you can go on to Fox or Fox Sports or Fox Sports 1, whatever it is, watch fights, and now really kind of get into a big audience because this is, you know, MMA over the last five to ten years has been one of the largest growing sports and industries. So and I, I, it's slowed down a little bit, and I see it continuously pick back up. Um, I'm excited to see what comes up with the future because this is just the beginning, and they will continuously have more TV shows and contracts, and we're even on the works on you know putting together our own TV show and our own version of those things. Yeah, that'd be great if, it, if there's ever an opportunity. I'd love to be on it. Yeah, we'd like... That's actually something we could definitely talk to you about, too, on, you know, doing a segment on our website. We, uh, that's, you know, it gives me a great idea, actually. I'd love to be able to do that. All right, well, after the interview, we can talk about it. Yeah. Now, the other question I was going to ask you is now just, actually, one more question. <laughs> question that's about the wrestling in the Olympics. Then we can, you can tell us anything you would like to. I don't mean to ramble on. I apologize. Yeah, I like it. Keep going. Now the question I was going to ask you is, um, there's a wrestler, Kurt Angle, who I don't know if it's a, a big story now, but he was talking about it a while ago, saying back in, going to be 2020, there's going to be no more pro wrestling in the Olympics. Now, two questions. The first one is, do you support having professional wrestling still being in the Olympics, and do you think at some point, MMA will also be part of the Olympics, too. Those are two great questions. The, the first part of it I just kind of want to clear is that technically it's not professional wrestling because it, because it's an Olympic sport you know, at this point. They can't legitimately get directly paid for it. They can have sponsorship deals, do other things, or have an allowance. Um, but realistically, it's not, it's not all it's cracked up to be financially. Um, until afterwards, you know, you can do a lot of things. But for the wrestling side of things, they actually, I think they, um, they put in a, I know they put in a petition, but I think it's actually been reversed where now MMA will be, I mean, wrestling will be in the, um, the next Olympics. So they, they've already like kind of taken course on that. And then for the MMA thing, that's a really great question. But I think if MMA becomes an Olympic sport, I think it'll take wrestling out only because if you're a wrestler and you're just a wrestler, you're going to be recruited to get into MMA from such a beginning, early age that, and I think more money is to be made in MMA just from the approach of it, that you're going to get pulled to that side of the fence nine out of ten times. Um, and that's actually talking to a couple of coaches that I know and hear saying in the industry is that they're working on with high schools and colleges having MMA teams where at, you know, in college, your first year you can only wrestle, second, or you can only do submission grappling, where it's takedowns and you have leg locks and arm locks and chokes. Second year, you can do, you know, strikes to the body and takedowns. And then third year, you could do, you know, you know, full-blown striking with the MMA, but there's no strikes to the head on the ground. And then when you get to your fourth year in college or your senior, then it's like almost full-blown MMA, and you're ready to almost be on a pro level. And that's going to be something that, again, will be a game-changer if they implement it because it's going to pull away from the wrestling programs and kind of develop the MMA. So I think it's definitely possible how close are we or how realistic is it in the next five to ten years? I have no idea, but I would love to personally see it. All right. Now, like I, I know I said one more question, but 
if you don't mind. Do you guys do anything for a tribute to the troops? I recently found out the UFC has been going over to tribute to the troops for 20 years, and I never, oh, overseas, and I never knew that. Now, does MMA do the same thing, or are you guys are not at that point? So, um, well, MMA, like, again, kind of like, when, technically I'm not, like, a representation of MMA in the sense of, like, the, the, the league. I'm just a fighter in MMA, like, in the mixed martial arts. Life, the life of a fighter is one of the companies in the industry and health and fitness. We personally do do work with our veterans and military and even current fighters where we're actually developing a program now where we just offer this uh, when you reach out to us and you message us. If you're in the military or if you have any kind of combat experience, anything like that, we'll develop a free nutrition and uh, strength conditioning program for you as our way of kind of giving back the best that we can. And then we always give you know special discounts on products and nutrition services and counseling and consulting. Um, but what we're offering to now with fighters, you're going to actually be able to sign up. You don't even have to like message us anymore. You'll be able to sign up for an account once you're registered in the database, whether it's an MMA database, whether it's you know the um, militaries. They have tons of databases. We'll be able to pull from them and set you up with an account where automatically you'll have a free you know custom uh, nutrition program and you'll have a free custom training program on a monthly basis as our way of giving back. No, I think that's a, that's a good down, wonderful thing you're doing. And then that just came up as an idea. Now, when those those people go back to overseas, they just don't know how to use a gun. They actually know how to use submissions and hand to hand combat, and that would help them overall. Exactly. So, I mean, I mean, they have certain training. Like one of the coaches here at the UFC gym that I'm a director at is that. One of our coaches, uh, Don Leon, he was, you know, uh, former military, uh, Rangers, uh, Army Ranger, and, you know, he's transitioned now into the, he's been a professional boxer, kickboxer, and professional MMA fighter, and now he's transitioned to the coaching side of it more, you know, he's um, certified in every concept of coaching, style, even strength programs, and he's very active in it, but he's also been able to train while he was in the military with certain boot camps now and core self-defense training so they kind of get that but any time that you can come home and develop on it even more and then go back and apply it or use another style it just hopefully it's going to protect them that much more or give them anything they may need in case a situation does arise where they're not going to be able to fully take care of themselves for whatever reason you know what i mean all right now moving on to the other subjects do you have any funny stories you like to share or are there, are there any subjects you would like to talk about I mean, there's always tons. I have tons of funny stories. I love stories personally. Some of them probably not the most appropriate for this channel, but one of them I can, um... <sighs> well, it is uncensored. Yeah. <laughs> I just, I don't think I would want to make some of these fun. Um, I mean, realistically, one of the things that I want to kind of go into, and this is something I knew that Randy Couture was big on when I was out in Vegas, is creating a union for fighters. A lot of people aren't fans of unions, and I'm still, like, doing the research to support it. But I think that, you know, anytime you can initially create a union for the right purposes, it's valuable, especially where fighters now, they, they you know, they're not making the money that they need to. to like well, The average professional fighter that's not in the UFC, or even let's say the average UFC fighter, will make about $15,000 a fight, maybe five. Five to 15000 is the average um, per fight contract. So if you fight three times a year, you made $45,000, anywhere from fifteen dollars to $45,000. But if you live on Long Island, that's not anywhere near close to being able to maintain and live and have a family off. If you're 20, it's great. Even tw even 27 at my age, like $45,000 for a fighter can make it work. But realistically, when you're 30, 35, you have a kid, family, you want to have you know your own home, it's just not realistic. So by looking into creating union and then realistically legalizing MMA in New York, it's got to happen by now. It's, it's unfortunate it hasn't. And that's another thing that we, as the life of a fighter, the company, are pushing to do. You can go to our website, lifeofafighter.com. We'll have articles and there's petitions up there. Um, another really big supporter is Tap, Nap, Snap, um, MMA Recap. They're a New York-based MMA news company. And they really support the legalization of MMA in New York. And um, that's pretty much it. Like Just kind of trying to create the awareness that it's not human cockfighting anymore, that it's a legitimate sport with athletes that sacrifice a lot. And um, kind of going from there. All right. Now, I just came up with an idea. 
Well, this, um, while we're just talking about, we were talking about everything, the cruiser rates and the women and everything. What about people who have warning dis just throwing it out there, people who have warning disabilities, and they want to get into the sport. Do you, you guys, you said, you know, the M&A, it doesn't discriminate, so, hypothetically, if there were a bunch of people who, you know, wink, wink, have warning disabilities or anything, do you think they would be given the opportunity, or do you think that's a liability? That's a great. That's a great question. Um, and it's funny. We actually did a piece on um, a fighter based out of Florida, and it was like even ESPN did a piece on him. And his name's uh, Garrett, and he has a disability, and he wants to fight, and he's trying to get sanctioned by the the state athletic commission, and they just won't do it. But you can even, like you can find him on Facebook, Google him, Garrett's fight. Um, you know his, his dad even reached out to us, and we're trying to help him raise money and do these different things for training, and getting sponsored. And I personally think that it's up to the coach. If, if I have a, if I, as a coach, if I have a fighter that comes in disability or not, if I feel that he comes in, he works hard, he has the background, he can intelligently defend himself, he can intelligently compete, and he can apply the things that we're teaching him. I don't think it's a problem as long as he passes a physical doctor's express that's not going to do any damage further along um, and he's physically okay to be in that physical kind of competition. No problem. Training is another thing where, you know, if you can't compete, just come in and train and get better. Both of those are fine. But um, I think getting sanctioned by commission is the real hard part because they're not, I really don't see them touching having um, any form of disability being able to come into a cage just because of what's on the line and, and the potential fear they have of what could happen. But it's, I, I, they've, they've had exhibitions with, you know, like I said, Gary, and, you know, he's won, lost, he's competed, he's, you know, it's a really, you know, huge thing. So it's not, it's not an impossible. Is it a likely? Probably not, but it's definitely a possibility that's always there. All right, well, wrapping up, do you have anything you want to say to your fans and listeners? You know, I just want to say thanks to you, Keith, for, you know, taking the time and asking me to do this. And um, anyone out there that's listening, any of our supporters, people that don't know, check us out, lifeofafighter.com. Um, you can find us on YouTube, Facebook, all social media. We're, we're, we're just trying to create our online presence is there. We're trying to go more physical now and do as much support as we can. And if you have a great story, go to our forum, share it. If you have questions, reach out to us. And, um... Just thanks for taking the time, and if you followed us, if you know about us, thank you for the support, and we look forward to doing bigger and better things in the future.